Okay. So thank you everyone who showed up for this first of hopefully many one world seminars on the mathematics of machine learning. Um, it's our pleasure to welcome Wine and E from Princeton University for the first talk. These talks will be held in the future um, uh, roughly on a weekly basis, always on Wednesdays at this time. Um, we are also organizing thematic days, which may be held at a different time. And the first one is at the end of July on the topic of the mean field training of multi-layer neural networks. And I think there are still a few people showing up, but it's probably time to start. If you know people who want to join later and uh, our, our Zoom license supports currently 300 people, uh, if you know people who will want to join later and can't get a spot in here anymore, uh, the talk is recorded and we plan on posting it to YouTube uh, in the next few days as soon as we manage. Did I forget anything important? Philip, Matt, Chow, Song? Okay. All good. I think we're ready to go. Okay, in that <laughs> case, um, please join me for uh, the first talk by Wine and E. And um, if the internet connection gets uh, problematic, I would ask you to turn off the cameras if you're not speaking. And um, if you want uh, to ask questions, uh, please ask them in the chat and there will be organizers in the chat uh, to answer questions. There will be co-authors in the chat to answer questions and otherwise to relay them to the speaker or allow you to unmute yourself. And without further ado, please rein in. Well, thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I also want to thank the uh, organizers, uh, Stefan, Chama, Songmei, Simon Du, Philip, I, I'm sure I forget several other people, uh, for organizing this uh, similar series uh, mathematics of machine learning is a very active field with lots of interest, and it's a very important field too. But I feel there's lots of confusion also, you know, mostly unnecessary, not uh, unnecessary confusion. So I'm hoping that uh, this seminar series would be a good platform for people to get to um, understand each other's work um, and moving the field forward. Um, also, I want to acknowledge my uh, uh, collaborators, Chama, Stefan Wostowski, and uh, Lei Wu. These are my former students or postdocs. And, and I want to uh, emphasize the fact that machine learning is a field in which young people are really playing a very, very important role. So as a matter of fact, um, I, was, I, I advised the organizers to invite young people to, uh, to give talks but they say you, they have to have some, you know, relatively not so young people to start. So I guess that's my task today. So first of all, let me, let me start by saying, so what would constitute a mathematics, mathematical understanding of machine learning? What do we talk, what are we talking about? What are we looking for? Okay, if you wanna say two things about machine learning, first of all is, is that it's, it's very successful, very powerful. It's, one of the most powerful tools that I have encountered in my scientific life. And secondly, it's also very subtle. If you remember, you know, three years or three or four years ago, maybe five years ago, being able to tune deep learning models and get good results was a very, very special uh, expertise. It's not, uh, it's much better now, but still machine learning, particularly deep learning is a very subtle, subtle uh, field. Let me just close the window. Okay, so our general objective is first to understand the reasons behind both the success and the subtlety. Second is to propose better, meaning more robust or more flexible machine learning models that are not so subtle, but you know, performs equally well. The strategies we're gonna follow are we prove theorems, that's important, 
And it's equally important, uh, very carefully designed numerical experiments, as well as very simple models, much simplified models, which can give us insight. So these three uh, components are standard practice in applied mathematics. <clears throat> but I feel they're not, they're not as popular in, in uh, theoretical machine learning, particularly the last two components. So I want to advocate those. Now, for this talk, first I want to try to uh, convince you that for regression problems, at least, uh, we, we start to have a reasonable picture about the mathematical understanding of, machine, uh, of supervised learning. In, uh, for regression problem. Secondly, I want to highlight what are the crucial missing pieces of the puzzle in order to make the picture more complete. So this is an outline. I'll start by discussing relative merits between uh, machine learning and make a com uh, comparison with classical numerical analysis. Secondly, I want to talk about function space and the gener generalization error estimates, and then talk about training and say something about shallow versus deep neural networks, and then say something about the continuous viewpoint of machine learning. OK, let me start. Raynan? Yes? Can I briefly interrupt you? Um, I think some people requested that you turn your video on. I, my video is not on? Your video oh, is turned on. My video. video. My video. We can see your slides, it? but not you. How do I turn my video on? Um, in the left bottom, there should be a crossed out camera symbol that should say start video. Start uh, mm. video. Start thumbnail thumb video. Start my video. Okay. Thank you. Is it working? Yes. Okay. So. Okay. So first of all, what is the problem of supervised learning? Well, we're given piece of data. So the the data the label is given by a target function f star. We're going to assume there's no measurement noise. Um, and then we, we, our task is to learn f star. So, or, or approximate f star. So, this is the problem of function approximation, but given a, only a finite piece of data. And so, for um, concreteness, we're going to assume the domain of interest is UniQ, and we are, uh, we're going to have uh, use mute to denote the distribution of the uh, data x. So the distribution mu is unknown. In practice, we divide the data into two subsets. One is a training set, one is a testing set. As I said, we're going to uh, focus on regression problem. Now, regression problems are less popular in classical deep learning. So classical deep learning is a lot about uh, computer vision or, or, or natural language processing. So regression problems are much less popular. So I'm going to give, uh, give you an example of an important regression problem. This is about learning the interatomic potential in molecular dynamics. So in molecular dynamics, you're looking at a system of atoms that describe some material or molecule. And the interatomic potential is the uh, potential, is a function that describes the interaction of all the atoms. So the independent variables are the positions of the atoms. If you have a million atom, this is a three million um, dimensional function. So here's an example of a work done by my, my former student, Ling Feng Zhang, um, on um, using deep learning tools to fit or parameterize this atomic potential. And the idea is that you get data from quantum mechanics models, and then you parameterize using deep learning tools. And there, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not do, going to talk too much about the subtleties or, or detail, technical details of that, but just to note that this model has been almost uniformly accurate across a very wide range of systems, starting from small molecules to big molecules to very complicated high entropy alloys, oxidized, et cetera. And with this kind of a tool, one can now advance molecular dynamics by a huge step. So here I'm describing the, uh, the, 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 the kind of um, progress we've made with, with what is called, so, uh, what is called um, ab initial molecular dynamics. So this is molecular dynamics, but with quantum mechanics accuracy. So the accuracy has to be comparable to quantum mechanics models. Before, you know, five years ago, 
we were able to handle like a thousand atoms. That was already considered to be a big system. With these deep MD or you know, machine learning assisted modeling, we can now handle uh, 100 million atoms. So this is an order of uh, five orders of magnitude progress. And with the 100 million atoms, we can now look at real systems. If you look, if you are limited to a thousand atoms, you, there is not very much you can do. So with this tool, we can realistically thinking about design or, 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 or modeling molecules, real molecules and real materials. Okay, so turning to the main focus of this talk, let me just say, what are the main puzzles? So first of all, why is it successful? It's successful not only, not only in classical AI, but also in molecular dynamics, as I just mentioned, and also solving very high dimensional PDEs, hundreds, thousands of dimensional PDEs. Also, this is something that we'd have, wouldn't, we would not have dreamed of several years ago. These are very high dimensional problems. So that's one thing. The second thing is why it's so fragile? Meaning that the results, the performance, depend very sensitively on the choice of the network architecture, you know, whether you choose small, small number of layers or, or bigger number of layers. It depends on the training process, what kind of um, optimization algorithm you're going to pick, GD, SGD, ADAM, or the hyper parameters, initialization, all kinds of stuff. Um, so, and the, 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 the generalization gap, meaning the difference between the testing and training accuracies, sometimes are big, sometimes are small. So it's very subtle, it depends very sensitively <coughs> on, the, um, on the hyper parameters as well as lots of other factors. So we want to understand the reason behind all these. The standard procedure for supervised learning consists of three steps. The first is choose a hypothesis space. This is just a set of trial functions. If you're doing nonlinear finite elements, this will be your you know, space for trial functions. And we can choose polynomials, piecewise polynomials or wavelets, as in classical approximation theory, or we can choose net, net, uh, neural network models as in modern machine learning. So I'm going to denote the, trial, uh, the hypothesis space by HM, where M is roughly the number of free parameters. So having that, then you're gonna look for the best candidate in this hypothesis space that approximates the target function. To do that, we, we try to minimize the empirical risk. So because this is the data we are given, this is the only, this is the only data we are given, this is the kind of loss function we can work with. Um, sometimes we just minimize the loss function, sometimes we add regularization. So this will be like the variational problem we wanna solve. And then we solve the variational problem by some particular optimization algorithm, either GD, SGD, or ADAM, or something else. And we choose a particular set of hyper parameters. Now, these three components, the, the, ideally, we would choose these three components in such a way that the population risk, which is what we're really interested in, is minimized. So this is the population risk. So keep in mind the important parameters are M, that's the number of parameters in the hypothesis space. N is the, number of, uh, is the size of the data set. T is the steps we take in the optimization algorithm. And D is the dimensionality. So these are the parameters we're in here. That's important. So let me make a comparison between machine learning and classical numerical analysis. As I said, classical numerical analysis would also deal with approximation of functions. So here I'm choosing splines as, an, uh, as a benchmark. One can also talk about finite elements, be similar. So in splines, the trial functions would be C1 piecewise cubic polynomials. So that's B splines. Machine learning, we should often choose neural network type of functions. The variational problems to be solved are very similar. You know, some, some uh, part that fits the data and some part that acts as a regularization. An optimization problem in classical splines, we often choose conjugate gradient. And in machine learning, well, we do gradient descent, stochastic, uh, stochastic gradient descent. Conjugate gradient is much less popular. Anyway, so there's lots of similarities on, on, on surface, at least. But there are also some very important differences. 
One is just the sheer size of the problem. In machine learning, we encounter problems for which we have hundreds of millions of parameters. And, and, also, and, and also the dimensionality, um, uh, the sheer difference in dimensionality. Classical numerical analysis, which we, we treat one, two, three dimensional functions. In machine learning, which we have to deal with millions of dimensional functions. And also, nonlinearity becomes much more, more important in machine learning, as I'll um, uh, come back to later. So in classical, so this is the summary slides for classical theory in classical numerical analysis. First of all, there is theory about error estimates. So this is a typical error estimate. And this one is called a priori estimates because the right-hand side depends only on the target function. This one is called a posteriori error estimates because the right-hand side depends on the numerical solution that you come up with. But most important is this factor here. M. M, remember, is the number of parameters. And here, alpha is some constant, two. Think of alpha as two or one. D is the dimensionality. It is this dimensionality that makes classical theory useless for machine learning, because this signals the curse of dimensionality. If you want to reduce this factor by a factor of 10, M has to be increased by a factor of 10 to the D. You know, D if D is a million, 10 to the million is a huge number. So this is where classical numerical analysis stops when it comes to machine learning. Now, this, in optimization, classical numerical analysis results often like this, where you have exponential convergence with a rate that depends on the condition number or some functions of condition number. For example, for gradient descent, this would be one over kappa, where kappa is condition number. If for conjugate gradient descent, this will be one of the square root of kappa. And so these, these are the kinds of results you see um, about optimization for classical numerical analysis. And the reason being that in classical setting, basically the, the, the crux of the matter is always the linear problem. The nonlinearity is much less important in classical numerical analysis. And in machine learning, it's totally different. So we would be looking for different kind of estimates. Anyway, I should also mention that this edge here is the solvent of space. So solvent of space are popular in classical numerical analysis because of you know, error estimates of this type. Now, we have to focus on high dimension. Now, one, one, one would ask, what would be a benchmark problem in high dimension? And that's high dimensional integration. So high dimensional integration is very popular, so popular that we forgot about it you know, how, how amazing this is. For, for example, in classical, um, uh, well, I wouldn't say classical, in statistical physics, people compute expectations of millions of variables all the time. But this is really remarkable that we can do this. And if you do this using quadrature rules like um, Simpson's rule or trapezoidal rule, then you would, would have error estimates of this type. And you can see that there's a cursor of dimensionality. So these kinds of grid-based quadrature rules are useless for high-dimensional quadrature. If instead you use Monte Carlo, then you would have this identity here. So notice that there is no dependence in the exponent on dimension. So this is good news. That's independent of dimension. Of course, you have this error constant, which is the variance of the function, and that can be huge in high dimension. So that's why variance reduction is so important in Monte Carlo integration. The whole subject of Monte Carlo integration is very much about variance reduction. And I'm going to say that the same kind of a theme also exists in, in supervised learning. OK, so <clears throat> we want to understand the error. So let's first decompose the error into two parts. So here, f star is the targeting function. f hat is the output of the machine learning model. And let's denote by fm the best approximation of f star, the target function, in our hypothesis space. Never mind what do we really mean by the best approximation. So then we can write this error into two parts. One is this first part, f star minus fm, which we call approximation error, because this is, is entirely due to the choice of the hypothesis space. The second part, we call estimation error, is the additional error that's caused by the fact that we only have you know, finite piece of data, 
So there's lots of things associated with that, you know, choice of the uh, algorithms, and all that contributes to the second term. Anyway, so, so the first term we already sort of discussed at least what, what happens in the classical setting. Let me give you a hint about the second term, the estimation error. The fact that there's a difference between training error and testing error. So this is also a classical phenomena. This is called Granger phenomena. What this is, is um, polynomial interpolation on an equally spaced grid. And the function, the targeted function is a very nice function. It's an analytic function, one over one plus 25 X squared. And you have, you know, because of the interpolation, so on the grid points, which are your training data here, everything is exact. But away from the grid points, away from the training data, you have huge error, particularly near the boundary. So this is the situation for which the testing error is very different from the training error. That's the kind of situation we want to avoid. We want the training and the testing to behave similarly. So, but as you can see that this kind of a difference, this kind of a behavior is already shown up in classical setting. The difference between the test and training, uh, testing and training error is called the generalization gap. And, and, and it's the difference between the population risk and the empirical risk. At a first sight, you might be tempted to say, okay, this is just the Monte Carlo distribution of this. So therefore you would expect that the difference would be like one of a square root of n, according to what I just said earlier about Monte Carlo. But this is not the case because that argument that I used there doesn't work here due to the fact that these functions that are participating here, namely the minimizers, we're interested in this generalization gap for the minimizer, for, for, for the um, output of the machine learning model. And the output of the machine mo learning model is very highly correlated with your data. So that argument doesn't work. As a matter of fact, this gap, generalization gap, is well known this generalization gap very heavily depends on the choice of the hypothesis space. If you choose your hypothesis space to be something like unit bar in the, in the space of Lipschitz functions, the generalization gap would be would scale like one over n to the minus, uh, uh, one over n to the one over d. So there again, there's a cursor with dimensionality at the level of the data. So this is the second potential core, uh, source of cursor with dimensionality. Okay, now the best we can hope for for this generation gap is something like one over square root of n. So that's the best we can hope for because that's already the Monte Carlo rate. And typically the gap would be bounded by you know, some norm over square root of n. This is the best we can hope for. If this holds, the first question is, what does this hold? And as I said, if you choose bad hypothesis space, it doesn't hold. But so we have to choose hypothesis spaces for which this does hold. And cases for which this does hold, we need to identify the norm, the coefficient here. We want this norm to be small. And we also want to make sure that this norm does not grow out of bound during training. Because if this norm grew out of bound during training, that means your generation gap deteriorates. Now, I said this best, you know, there are possible improvements like using, you know, notions of local Radama complexity. Um, uh, you could possibly improve this a little bit, but the improvement is small at higher dimensions. So we're going to neglect all those. As a matter of fact, you know, this, this kind of a scenario happens all over the place with Monte Carlo, when Monte Carlo is involved, you could have small improvements over the exponent by something like one over D, but we're going to ignore all that because that's not so important in high dimension. <clears throat> so I mentioned uh, curse over dimensionality from approximation error. I mentioned the curse over dimensionality from the uh, size of the data, the es estimation error. And there's also possible curse over dimensionality in the training dynamics. So this is the result proved by uh, Stefan and myself. Uh, basically, it says that if you choose two layer neural network models, okay, then if your functions, if, you, if your target function is only Lipschitz continuous, then it is possible that the rate at which the, 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 the risk, either empirical risk or whatever risk, decays to zero, is, is, is suffers, of, uh, suffers from a curse of dimensionality. Okay, so that's also possible, but I'm not gonna uh, dwell too much on this <coughs> aspect. 
Okay, so the first um, uh, topic that I want to discuss is uh, is, is, is the uh, generalization error. How big, how small can generalization error be for a particular hypothesis space? Okay, so here, so given a particular machine learning model, a particular hypothesis space, two-layer neural networks or resonance. So we want to ask potentially how small can you make the generalization error be? To, to be? How, how, uh, what's the best possible scenario? So in order to do this, we follow sort of the, um, the following strategy, namely the first step is to take a look at the approximation error. And this is done by, in order to do that, we follow classical approximation theory, namely identify the spaces that's suited for this particular machine learning model. So there's a, there, there is a classical uh, procedure, standard procedure for doing that. In classical numerical analysis, all the spaces are solid spaces. But in machine learning, as you'll see, that different machine learning models attach to different spaces. So, the, so by doing so, we, get, we, 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 we identify this norm. And having identified this norm, then we ask, no. The, a norm is attached to a space. So having identified this norm, meaning having, having identified the space, we ask whether the space has a small complexity, small meaning that the Brahma complexity has such a bound. So if this works, if both works, we're in a very good luck, okay? But these two are contradicting, are fighting against each other. For the Brahma complexity to be small, we want space to be small. But for the approximation error to be small, we want the space to be big. So these two guys fight against each other. But if both were true, then we might expect the following kind of estimates. Okay, so the population risk or the generalization error is bounded from above by the approximation error plus the generalization gap up to some logarithmic terms. So these are, kinds, these are the kinds of estimates we will be hoping for. Never mind how to get a machine learning output that that satisfies us, but, but this will tell you that in principle, this can be done. It's possible to achieve this kind of a bound. Okay, so let me give you a concrete example of how this could work, work out. This is two layer neural networks. So consider a hypothesis space of the following type. Here, the parameters are AJs and WJs. These are my, our parameters. So these are, two-layer neural, uh, two neural network models. So we're gonna consider functions of this form, okay? This form, this might look very strange. Why, why are we you know, restricting ourselves to functions of this form? Okay, the first answer is that this is, at least symbolically, the, 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 the continuum limit of functions of this type, where we replace the, uh, the average by an expectation. Okay, so here rho is the probability distribution on the space of parameters. So that would be the first answer. It's just the, the, the continuum limit. The second answer is that if you want to ask what kind of functions are in this space, so there are now results uh, of this type. So for example, there are results by Barron, classical results by Barron, and there are also a more recent paper by Stefan and myself for which we in which we characterize functions that can be represented um, uh, in this form. Anyway, so with functions that uh, admit this kind of representation, we can define a norm. This would be like some sort of um, uh, moments. Um, we call this a path norm, generalized path norm. And this norm is taking, um, a big, big, since, since the row here is not unique, now for a fixed function f, you might have many, very many rows for which this is true. So here we take an infimum over all such rows. And that, and functions for which this norm is finite are called Baron functions. We, we name this after Baron. So these are called Baron functions. <clears throat> so now that we, I just define a space. So why is this space important? In particular, why do I claim that this space is the natural space for two layer neural networks? 
And this is because of the following two theorems, a direct and an inverse approximation theorem. Namely, for any functions in the Baron space, we can approximate them with a rate that's one over square root of m, so the Monte Carlo rate. Okay. That's the direct approximation theorem. And conversely, if you have a function f star, then it can be approximated by, by finite two-layer neural networks for which the norms are uniformly bounded. The norms of these um, finite neural networks are uniformly bounded. If that's the case, then this target function f star has to be in the Baron space, and its Baron norm has to be bounded by the same constant. So these two theorems, you know, the direct and inverse approximation theorems, basically tells us that, that you know, the Baron space are the spaces of functions for which you can approximate uniformly with, with, with uniform bounds. Things don't blow up by two-layer neural networks. <clears throat> And so that's the one side of it. Namely, this space of functions has good approximation properties uh, for, um, when, when, when approximated by two-layer neural networks. The other side of it, namely the complexity, is also under control. This is a theorem uh, seemed to be first proved by Bach, Francis Bach, and tells us the Riemann complexity has the, has the desired uh, bound, one over square root of n. Putting this together, we can show the following, that, that if you consider a regularized model, so if you regularize the, the empirical loss by this kind of a, um, a term, where this is, is the um, path norm defined for the, for the finite neural network, the path norm is, is exactly the same as the Baron norm, the analog of Baron norm, just for finite neural networks. So if you consider a regularized model, then as long as the, big, the lambda is bigger than some absolute constant, the minimizers of this norm satisfies these kinds of generalization error estimates that I promised before, namely one of the square root of m and one of the square root of n with coefficients given by the Baron norm. You know, there are these logarithmic terms that come from concentration inequalities. <clears throat> so these norms, so, so what, what, does these, uh, uh, what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that, that there are, there do exist good functions in the high positive space that have nice generalization error estimates. They do exist. If you want to have them, you, you, if you want to find them, you can find them by, minimize, by using this uh, regularized model. Now, I have to emphasize that I'm not advocating regularized model. As a matter of fact, it seemed to be one of the biggest mysteries in, in, in understanding machine learning is why things seem, why there seem to be implicit regulation mechanism. But if you want to have, you know, at least this regularized, regularized model tells you that there are good solutions. Good solutions do exist. Okay. Now these kind of estimates is different from more typical result in machine learning literature, which looks like this. Namely, the generalization gap is bounded by some norm of the you know, parameter that you found and divided by square root of n. So we call these a posteriori error estimates in, uh, in, in analogy with the classical numeric analysis. And these would be called a, por a priori error estimates. Okay? Anyway, now, so this is sort of the story for uh, uh, um, two layer neural networks. Similar, you can do similar things, carry out a similar program for other models, for example, the random teacher model, and in which case the hypo, you know, in which case um, the hypothesis space would be something like this, where phi is the feature is a collection of random features, and and w is a random variable for the random teacher model. So this would be a standard hypothesis space for the random teacher model, and <clears throat> in this case, the corresponding function space is the representing kernel Hilbert space. Okay, and then you can prove you know very similar. Um, direct and inverse approximation theorems, complexity estimates, is, estimates, and as well as the bounds on the um, generalization error. But you know, the most important thing to note here is that is that the representing kernel Hilbert space with this particular kernel defined by the random feature 
is the right space for the random teacher model. Okay. And then for resonance, there's also a notion of the right space for resonance. And this is um, in, uh, introduced by uh, Ma and Wu and myself last year, which we decided to call, call the flow induced function space. Okay, I'm not going to define it here, its definition is a little bit involved, but the point being that for this flow induced function space is naturally associated with the resonance in the sense that one can show a direct and inverse approximation theorem holds for functions in this space. And if you consider a regularized loss function, oh, by the way, the complexity is also, um, you know, you can also prove something like this for the complexity. Um, if you, if you um, consider regularized models in the same way, and then you find that up to logarithmic terms, the generalization error of the minimizers of the regularized model satisfies this kind of a bound. Okay, now if you if you are really sharp, your eyes are really sharp, you notice that this is two instead of one here. So this means that I believe that this is not optimal, this should be one, but we are not able to do this yet. But assuming this is the one then, then you might ask going from, um, going from random feature to barren to resonance, what, what has changed? And I want to argue that this is just like a variance reduction, namely the coefficients, the error constant becomes smaller and smaller going from the reproducing kernel Hebrew space to barren space to uh, this uh, flow induced function space. These can all be proved uh, very, in a very simple way. <clears throat> so that's a variance reduction procedure going from you know, random feature to barren to, uh, uh, to two layer to resonance. Um, multiple layers, multiple neural networks, for example, three layers, four layers, five layers. So in that situation, the, it's not as complete, but Steph and I are writing a paper about in which we define multi-layer spaces. And this multi-layer spaces has the feature that we can show both inverse and direct approximation theorems hold. So the, uh, and, and the Radama complexity is also bounded by the normal square of N. But the direct approximation theorem, in, uh, in the approximation theorem, the rates is not the same as Monte Carlo at the moment. So we can prove something like this where M is the width, uh, and say, say the, uh, the width of the layer, but the number of parameters is more than M. The number of parameters is M to the two L minus one, so where L is three, four, five, or something like that. So, so this is, depends on the number of layers, but it's an independent of the dimension. And it's not 100% clear that this is the best one can do. Anyway, <clears throat> so this is what we know about, uh, 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 the approximation property of these hypothesis space. Notice that so far we haven't said anything about the training or anything like that. It's just, uh, it's just tried to characterize the hypothesis space. So now, now let's look at training. So particularly we want to look at the behavior of training and testing errors. There are many, many issues. For example, there, uh, let's, we can put them in two, two categories. One is the optimization problem. Can we make the training error small? How fast can it small? And this is sort of because the loss function is non-convex. And can there be a possible curse of dimensionality in time? That's the first issue. The second issue is perhaps even more subtle, is that can we make the testing error small? And this is because that in typical machine learning setup that we encounter now, the global minimum of the uh, empirical risk is very far from being unique. As a matter of fact, Cooper, uh, you know, proved that that the global minimum, under some conditions, the global minimum forms a manifold of the right dimension. <clears throat> so, so because this the global minimum of the training is non-unique, we have to ask which ones do we pick out of all this? And some generalize well, some don't generalize so well. So we have to make sure we pick the, the ones that do generalize well. And that's the issue of implicit regularization. Okay, so, so let me, I'm, so 
let me first show you some um, some 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 unexpected or maybe even expected. I'm not sure subtleties of um, that could happen. So this is just a random feature model. It's just a random feature model, simple random feature model. And here you show on the left is the test error, test error here, the, the uh, blue, as a function of the number of features. Okay. You can see that when the number of features is the same as the degree, uh, the, 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 the data, the number of data, m equal to n, the test error becomes very big. At the same time, the norm, sorry, the eigenvalue of the of the hash uh, of the uh, grand matrix associated with this random feature model becomes very very small. So we call this a resonance phenomena. If you think about you know resonance in physics, but this is also pretty much the same as the double descent, better known as double descent. You can see that the descent here is this here. So why is this so? And first of all, why is this so? This sounds like really bad news because you're Test error is very sensitive depending on the on the uh, features, but in fact it's not that bad in the sense that the dynamics actually helps you. So this can be seen from the following picture. So here, if you look at it, um, the the blue, the blue is the test. Yeah, the blue is the test error as a function of training. Notice that the test error de de uh, de uh, decays here and then, then remains flat for a very long period of time, four decades, and then eventually grow to a very big number. So if, you, if you're not so patient, if you stop your calculation at 10 to the seven iterations, you would get a solution with a very good generalization property. It's, the double descent phenomena refers to here. If you really look for the minimum norm solution, it refers to here. But very rarely you would have that kind of patience. And that, that's sort of a good news in the sense that the dynamics of training actually helps you to select a good solution. And, and it's not like you need to have very um, sophisticated early stopping criteria. You can stop any time during these four decades of time, of iterations. Okay. Yeah, anyway, so one can also say that, there, that, the, that, the, that the, the training process can be divided into three regimes. The first regime in which the test error decreased, the second regime, intermediate regime, in which the test error stays small, and then the last regime for which the test error grows and becomes very big. And one can, for simple situations, for example, take a, a typical, a simple target function, one can even prove that this is the case. And, and I don't want to show you the theorem, but I want to, I think it's more helpful to look at, to look at this picture. Namely, that you can see that the, um, the, 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 the bad error, test error is also, is coincides with the small, eigenvalues of the grand matrix. And this is easily understood because the minimum solution, expression for minimum solution involves one over lambda, where lambda is eigenvalue. So if the lambda is small, then there's a term which is one, very big. At the same time, the dynamics involves some term which is e to the minus lambda t. So if lambda is small, e to the minus lambda t develops very, very slowly. That's why you have this. So that can all be described in this theorem here. And you can find that theorem in the paper that's going to be appear in the, the first meeting of uh, MSML, Mathematical and Scientific Machine Learning. That's original was scheduled uh, this month in Princeton, but it's going to be online. Okay, so this is one, this is one sort of uh, story that tells us that things can be very, very subtle. You know, it, the random teacher model is a linear model, the simplest model one can think of. St still, the training and the testing can be quite, quite subtle. So let's now look at a more a realistic situation, namely uh, two-layer neural networks. So by which 
I'm going to I'm going to use a form of two-layer neural networks that's um, popular in the literature. Um, that's in this form. And note that the difference between this form and something I'll mention later, later, which has also uh, got a lot of popularity in the in the community right now, it's called mean field scaling. So mean field scaling would have a one over m here. Okay, if you notice, my function space had a one over m, but but here let's look at a situation for which we don't have this one over m. And ask study that uh, ask questions about the training dynamics. Notice that for the previous topic, namely generalization error, having one of them or not having one of them doesn't matter because I can always lump that into here. But for, for, the, for the training dynamics with one of them or without one of them actually does matter because the dynamic equations are different. Okay, that's very important. Anyway, with this kind of a scaling, which we call conventional scaling, and let's look at Xavier-like initialization. This is sort of the, the default initialization in, uh, in TensorFlow, which means that the coefficient a would, 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 would be a, a normal random variable with uh, variance beta squared. Beta can either be zero or uh, one of square of m. And the um, uh, b uh, is a normal random variable of size one. <clears throat> so a is much less smaller than b. OK, so associated with this two-layer neural network model, there is a random feature model in which we just freeze the b as the, at the initial value. We only train a. So this is a random feature model that's closely related to this uh, two-layer neural network model. And then there's a, one can define this grand matrix <clears throat> as I defined before. So for this particular model, there is something that's already known in the literature. This is one of the very few situations for which the theory is reasonably complete. And that is the situation in the very over parameterized regime. You know, M is much bigger than N you know, to some power. So what do we know? First of all, there is a piece of good news. Uh, this is a very um, ex uh, important result proved by uh, Simon Du and collaborators, for which they prove that in the highly over parameterized regime, there's always exponential convergence I wouldn't, I shouldn't say always. There is high, with high probability, there's an exponential convergence of the training error. So this is a very good news. That optimization problem is, is, is simple. The optimization behavior is nice. But there is also a piece of bad news, which says that the solution that converged to is no better than the random feature model. And so the, these, are, these are the two statements here. As a matter of fact, Uniformly over the training path, over the GD path, the what you get from the two-layer neural network and what you get from the associated random feature model are uniformly close. Okay, so this is bad news. You're you, you're not doing, you know, it's not the two-layer neural network model is not helping. You could you could have just done um, work with the random feature model. In particular, in this case, there's no implicit regulation. So this is both good and bad. <clears throat> and the reason being, uh, being that in this particular regime, the time scale for the A's and B's are very different. So B is effectively frozen. Now, what happens in practice? We might particularly want to ask, you know, in the over-parameterized regime, it's not better than the random feature model. Now, is it possible to still have a regime for which it, it, is, it is better than the random feature model? which means that there is some sort of implicit regulation. If there is such a regime, what is the mechanism for implicit regulation? So for this, to answer this question, or get, to get some insight into this question, let's look at a very simple target function, the one neuron target function. Okay, so we have written a, a paper that contains many more results of this type, but here I'm just, I'm just showing you the result for a one neuron, uh, one neuron target function. So in this case, let's look at two situations. First, let's look at the uh, two images uh, uh, in the bottom. So in the, here we have M, the number of neurons is 2,000, and the number of data points uh, is 200. And you can see that if you look at the training and testing curve, that the, the uh, neural network training curve and the neural network testing curve are both very, very close. 
to the random feature model. So that's exactly what was proved here. But you know, it's already happening in this you know, parameter regime. And if you look at the parameters, you know, this, in particular, this parameter, AJ, you know, normalized by the normal B, you'll see that they're you know, just like random numbers. So this is the one situation. This is sort of the, let's say this is the highly over-parameterizing regime. Now let's look at the opposite situation, the, the, the very, very under-parameterized regime. You know, in particular, let's take N to be infinity. So M is 200. So this is the very under-parameterized. Then you'll see that the random feature model looks like this. And the neural network model looks like this, the training curve. But more importantly, if you look at how the solutions behave, the orange dots are the result of the random feature. And the blue dots are the result of the neural network. You'll see that this other than two points, all the other neurons have, you know, their coefficient now very, very small. Now you might say this is not surprising. This is indeed not so surprising. But this fact, this, this feature suggests that, that the path norm cannot be very big. So therefore the generalization can be not, cannot be very bad. So, right. yeah. Right. Um, there is one question about what the activation function was in those calculations. Relu. Okay. And um, the talk was scheduled for roughly an hour and it is eight minutes from the end at the moment. I think uh, given that it's a Zoom talk, we can overrun somewhat, um, but maybe if people have questions, they can collect them now in the chat and we can uh, try to collect those before, before the hour runs out and then um, continue afterwards. For a little okay. bit. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of fast forward the rest. Um, okay. okay, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so I didn't realize this. <laughs> it's longer than I expected. So any, in any case, then one can divide, one can sort of roughly, you know, very subjectively, divide um, the training into two kinds of behavior. One is neural network behavior, one is a random feature-like behavior. So in the neural network um, case that, you know, you would have neurons that divide in two groups. One group is activated neurons, just like these guys. The other group is sort of the background ones, just like these guys in the bottom. Okay, so, but in the random feature case, you more or less see this kind of behavior. And, and if you look at what happens in the NM, um, in NM plane, you would have this kind of, uh, shall we say, phase transition. This is more like random feature, this is more like your network. And then you look, look at the training, uh, the uh, test error, you know, the random feature, the, the neural network have something like this. Okay, so this is the re, re, regime where it sort of coincides with the random feature. And at the same time, the path norm, you know, jumps. Okay, um, I'm, I was gonna say uh, 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 something about ADAM, but let me just uh, mention very quickly. So people who have used ADAM typically uh, may, may have experienced that ADAM has, you know, this kind of training curves for which there are rare fast decay and there's big spikes and then there's small oscillations. So one can sort of understand um, uh, this in, in a way that, you know, maybe not fully rigorously, but rather, you know, combination with careful numerical experiments and, you know, model analysis, one could understand in the parameter regime, which one of these um, you're observing. Anyway, so why do I talk about this? The reason I talk about this, oh, there's another thing, is that if you different optimizers here, GD and SGD, selects different global minima. So here's an example for which that, you know, the GD almost converged to a global minima, but then all of a sudden you switch to SGD and you find that it doesn't converge to the, the, the target, the, the, um, the global minima that it was on track to, but rather switches you know, jumps away and switch the totally different global minima. So this is another kind of a subtlety. You know, <clears throat> so there are other subtleties, for example, batch normalization, dropout. In any case, in any case, what I'm saying here is that, is that, you know, by changing different parameters, you, you have qualitative change of behavior. Okay. Okay. So that's one kind of a subtlety associated with neural networks. I'm going to actually pretty much skip the this part, and I'll say something about at the end. So let me just say one thing. 
I, then I'll close, as a matter of fact. So because of these subtleties, we want to ask for, you know, can we have, shall we say, well posed formulation of machine learning? Meaning that, that the, that the uh, formulation itself is pretty robust and stable. It's not very uh, sensitively dependent on, on these hyperparameters. So can we do something like this? Okay, this is what's gonna be my topic next, namely advocating uh, a continuous formulation of machine learning. You started with a continuous formula, you started with some continuous representation of functions by either integral transforms or you know, flows. Okay, so you use these to represent your function and you use these to construct your hypothesis space. And then using that, you can define a variational problem. And, and then from that variational problem, there are standard procedures in physics and mathematics for which to define different kinds of gradient flows. So this is a sort of a, a, a slightly different strategy than what's conventional in uh, machine learning. Namely, you start with a continuous formulation and then you discretize. So the key here is that you want to make sure your variational problem is nice, is nice. So I was going to give you some more examples of this, but I, I think I should just skip this and then conclude because I think probably the conclusion is more important than um, these details. Okay, so I skipped a lot, but <laughs> let me say that uh, what do we, what, what is the kind of picture that's emerging now? So first of all, why is this machine learning so successful? Well, at the level of approximation, new neural network based models have the capability to overcome the curse of dimensionality, just like Monte Carlo for integration. So neural networks are like Monte Carlo for integration. So they are the uh, analog for function approximation, the analog of Monte Carlo for function approximation. And luckily, or coincidentally, the Radama complexity of these spaces are also controlled. And the optimization landscape is nice. You know, I say nice in quotation marks because this is, this is um, we don't know how to quantify it. That's nice. Okay, and, and, and we understand some of the implicit regulation mechanisms, although definitely not all of the optimization, uh, of the implicit regulation mechanism. So this is, this is, is uh, the first question. The second question, why is it so fragile? So why do we have the sensitive dependence on lots of things like, like the neural network architecture, like the optimization algorithm, you know, for, for, for particular, uh, um, I skipped the dis discussion about ADAM. If you choose different parameters in ADAM, you'll see your training behaves very differently, okay? So the most important remaining puzzle, I would say is, is why can we train neural network models in the first place? You think about it, you know, for me, who had some background in chemistry or material science, molecular dynamics, we would never dreamed of using gradient descent to do optimization in these kinds of settings because this would be disastrous. But that's what people always use in machine learning. So why is that so? There are, there are some preliminary results, very nice results, Jusen Bach in particular, that sheds some light, but definitely there's a lot to be done, a lot to be understood in here. So in summarize, I would say there is a reasonable picture that's emerging for regression problem. And I would say we should put more emphasis on better formulations of machine learning, such as the continuous formulation, although I had to step uh, to, to, to skip this part. And of course, there's other machine learning problems. I only discussed regression, but there's classification, there's GAN, there's RN, there's R. The reinforcement learning, all those are much less clear. Let me end by this slide. So this is a pure math slide that, that what we are talking about, what we're aiming at is really high dimensional, build high dimensional analysis. High dimensional integration is Monte Carlo. High dimensional function approximation is you know, neural network based regression. High dimensional probability distribution, that's the classification GAN and dynamical systems, that's RN, and PDEs. So reinforcement learning is about PDEs. So actually I should go backwards, I, I go backwards. That RN is about high dimensional dynamic systems. Reinforcement learning is about high dimensional PDEs. Namely, so to understand all these guys, you know, all these guys, we, what we really need to build high dimensional versions of these guys. 
Okay, we already know quite well about integration. I discussed today about function approximation. Then these three, we know much less about, but this is what we need to do. We need to carry out the same kind of program as I described today for these three different categories. And that's uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a pure math sort of a framework, what do we need to do? What do we need to accomplish? Okay, I'm sorry that um, I had to skip a lot of things. You know, I'll stop here. And thank you for your attention. Okay, um, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, there are a few people who asked questions in the chat and I will ask them to, um, uh, to unmute themselves so that they can ask the uh, questions in person. Um, if you have more questions, please, um, please let me know. Um, actually, I don't think I can do that uh, separately, so I will just ask everybody to um, uh, allow everybody to unmute themselves and if you've got questions then please uh, please ask them and okay so we already had a couple of questions in the in the chat so I can maybe read them or someone can read them um, so I think the first question that I have to find that is in the estimate for approximation error, the space HM is nonlinear. Can be uh, can techniques of nonlinear approximation a la Devor be used, or could one use Bezos spaces? And the question, uh, the second question, the big one is what about stability? Okay, so one is muted. Ah. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yes. So first of all, Bessel space, I don't think is the right thing because it's very similar to, um, to um, subordinate space. So these derivative space, space and not the right object. Now, nonlinear approximation theory, I think potentially can, can be uh, relevant here, but I don't know how to do it. Do it. Uh, stability, actually, a very good question. Um, I skipped uh, uh, I skipped some slides, actually, if you maybe give me the opportunity to go back and show the slides to you. So this, so fully connected neural networks are unstable. <clears throat> Deep fully connected neural networks, that's because their gradients grow exponentially fast. You know, air is the number of layers. So kappa is to be like the Yap number exponent. So these, these are unstable. That's one of the reasons why, you know, fully connected, deep fully connected neural, neural networks are difficult to train. And there's something similar like this happening for our recurring neural networks. Um, so stability is definitely an issue. Um, th this, this is a numerical stability. Now, if you ask about stability for th in, this, in the theoretical sense, there's something like CR's lemma here too. So stability in that sense is almost automatically guaranteed. CR's yeah. lemma refers to the lemma in the final elements. <clears throat> so this brings us to uh, the next question, which would be, uh, would these results hold for convolutional networks? That's another thing. Um, uh, okay, it does, but then for convolutional neural networks, we hope something better to be proved. And I think there's no serious work in this direction yet. So how do you, you know, so quantify in what sense is convolutional neural networks better than the usual fully connected neural networks? So I, I don't think there are sort of very insightful results, theoretical results about this yet. Then there is a question on the generalization error part. If we do not have the constants in the generalization gap, only the one over square root n rate, can we hope to use this to be able to guide the choice of the architecture and the hyperparameters in practice? Okay, that's, um, yeah, 
if you look if you at, if you look at what happened in the final elements, so the terminology of prostory uh, error estimates first came uh, from final elements, and that's exactly how it was used. It designed these uh, prostory error estimates and then used that to 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 guide you how to refine the mesh. And here, this question is exactly this, this in a similar spirit, but. I'm not aware anybody has seriously done that. In, in principle, I would say it's doable. In practice, how it's done, um, I haven't given this a lot of thought. I think whoever asked the question should give this uh, some thinking. I think that's a very fruitful uh, direction. Yes. Um, there is a question that has been asked twice whether the slides will be available. And I think we can post them if you want them online or otherwise not. And an off-topic question, what do they recommend if not gradient descent in molecular dynamics? Which I think might be a question for the breakout room later. And um, then uh, I am just skimming through more questions. Um, let me see. Otherwise, if uh, if people would like to ask questions personally, uh, they should now be able to unmute themselves. Hello. Hello. Hi, Raynan. Hi. So, uh, follow up with stability. Training minimizes loss, but ac accuracy not necessarily increases when loss is minimized. Yeah. Uh, my, my question is that's that's a fundamental issue of stability any of your tools or settings would allow to provide to guarantee stability in this sense and when we train when we minimize loss then accuracy also increases any kind of sufficient conditions or empirical or numerical that is to me an important issue um, I, I, well, I don't understand why you said there's a stability. Why do you say there's a stability? Issue? Because if uh, initially you have a, a small amount oh, of misclassified objects, it would not grow. The amount yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah, misclassified yeah, yeah. objects should not grow, and training does not guarantee yeah. that. Okay, I see what you're saying. So the, the, the norm sort of grow, the, the, the crucial norm grow in, during dynamics. Um, the answer, I don't know. I don't have any answer. To How do we design? A training algorithms for which you guarantee that the norm, the crucial norm that we that was identified, does not grow. Mm -hmm. You know, without doing something extra, you know, you know, do explicit regulation. The answer is we don't know. Mm -hmm. I just one more sentence. I think this is important because if there is no stability in this sense, then it's hard to know when you stop training because eventually later. Uh, number of misclassified objects can increase, and that would be bad. But anyway, thank you very much, Wayne. And you you're welcome. Wayne, very nice talk. Uh, I do have a question on your appeal rebounds. I, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, in the in the PD setting, I mean, your appeal rebounds depend on the. Um, D norm of F star, right? Mm -hmm. and this D norm is typically unknown. And the, in the PDE setting, you can use compactness to bound this, this kind of norms, this subset of norms. But in machine learning, you don't have an underlying PDE. So you, you can get a priori bounds under the assumption that some norm is bounded, but you have no control over that norm. So my question is, do we have any error estimates that does not require some underlying assumption that the function to be approximated has some norm that is bounded in some in some space because otherwise you see i can also create a, a, a norm that is a weighted sum of sub of norms and i will not have the curse of dimensionality with respect to that norm if i assume that the function belongs to that uh, to the space induced by, by that norm yeah, well, that, that's a that's a good point. That that's actually a very good point. And in PDE setting, we can bound this norm by the norm of the data, uh, yes. because of PDE theory. And here we don't. Um, so, 
that's an, an argue, that's an argument to uh, in, in favor of this kind of estimates for which you know this is the this is the parameter that you've trained so you can calculate this norm and then you can evaluate this bound. The problem being that typically this norm you know is very big. So my answer to your question is actually once you have trained you can actually estimate how big this norm is. I don't have any results here, but, but we have done so. That you, you can sort of give an, a, a, a rough estimate of how big this, these norms are from, the, from your machine learning output. But your, uh, your estimates will only, will only be lower bounds on, on the actual norm. So for instance, in RKHS, if you use the norm of your interpolant to, uh, to uh, uh, as an approximation, of uh, the norm of the function that is uh, interpolated, you only get a lower bound. Yeah, it's not actually, rigorous. It's not per bound. Yeah, I agree with you. This, when I say estimate, it's not rigorous. It's just to give you, give you an, um, an idea of, um, of how things uh, look like. No, look, I mean, at this stage, I wouldn't say that these kind of bounds can already give you a quantitative uh, estimate of the actual accuracy, actual error, I wouldn't say so. It's more or less give you a qualitative guidance, um, you know, understanding of the different algorithms and different models and different theory, as a matter of fact. I see that, thank you. Is, because it's apparently depends on the problem. Is there a tight a posteriori fashion bounds that we can use to estimate these norms? There could be, but I, I'm not aware of any. There could be, I mean, there could be, that could be proved, but I think the existing ones that don't meet that standard, don't meet that requirement. Okay, if there are no more questions, then please let's thank Raynan again for the talk. And um, the next seminar will be next week at the same time. Uh, also, the Zoom link will be published on the mailing list and on the website briefly before the talk. And the speaker will be Eric Van Naden from uh, New York University Grant Institute. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thanks, thanks, thanks everybody. everybody.